All right. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this latest installment in the Hunt Institute's Post-Secondary Pathways webinar series. I'm James Michalowski, our Director of Higher Education, and we're so excited for today's conversation and so happy to be joined by our wonderful three guests. Um, I am going to kick things off with a couple of brief, brief housekeeping notes, and we'll talk a little bit about the theme of today's discussion, but I don't want to take too much time because we've got some uh, fascinating uh, guests with us today, and I want to make sure to jump right into it. Um, the first thing to mention is that um, this webinar, uh, it will be live streamed on Facebook as well. Um, and if you'd like to follow along on Twitter, you can do so using the hashtag post pathways. You can also feel free to submit questions via Twitter as well. Our team will be monitoring those. And I also wanna let people know that captioning services are available for this webinar. There's a closed captioning button towards the bottom of your Zoom screen that you can use. I also wanna note that we want to reserve plenty of time for your questions. Uh, for the logistics of submitting questions, we will not be unmuting lines at any point. And so we're gonna ask that people submit their questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom, which again is at the bottom of your screen. So please do submit questions via that way. Um, today's conversation is gonna focus on the, the rapid shift to remote learning that happened in the wake of the pandemic. And we are going to be reflecting on lessons learned from that time, which students benefited from that rapid shift to online learning, which students may have faced additional barriers because of that shift, and what are some lessons and takeaways for policymakers. Um, and, and without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the conversation. We're so thrilled to be joined by Commissioner Zora Mulligan, the Commissioner of Higher Education in Missouri, uh, also joined by Janet Godwin, the Chief Executive Officer of ACT, and last but not least, Gerard Robinson, Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies in Culture Foundation. Commissioner Mulligan, I'd love for you to kick us off a little bit. Could you please tell us a little bit about your background, your role as Commissioner, um, and some of the, the things that your department oversees as you seek to support higher education in Missouri. Sure, absolutely. So give me a thumbs up to let me know you can hear me, please. I can hear you, but we just lost your video. <laughs> Good grief, I'm sorry. That's I keep okay. thinking that we'll get through uh, this year and that we'll all be complete <laughs> Zoom geniuses and yet I continue to surprise myself. There well, you so are, you're back. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I wanted to start really just by acknowledging the importance of the Hunt Institute. Uh, Missouri has been a really active partner of the, of the Hunt Institute and really grateful for what you all bring. Uh, you know, in Missouri, like a lot of states, we have a lot of very challenging conversations about education, both at the K-12 and post-secondary level. And the Hunt Institute has been an important resource for us in bringing people together to identify shared interests. Uh, in the past, I would have said if you have a meeting and the only thing that happens is people talk, uh, then it would not be a successful meeting. But in the climate we're living and working in today, again, coming together and having those conversations is invaluable. So thank you to the Hunt Institute for everything you do for our state. Um, so as uh, was said, I'm the Commissioner of Higher Education here in Missouri. Uh, we're a coordinating board state, which means you know we have um, the ability to approve academic programs and make recommendations about public institutions' missions. The biggest part of what we do is budget recommendations and the administrative administration of the state student financial aid programs. Um, you know, but if I'm talking to my mom or trying to explain to a neighbor what we do, I tell them that we help Missourians get jobs. We help employers find employees. We help people get to and through college and we provide uh, information that people can use to make decisions about work and life. Our agency is a little bit broader um, than a lot of SHEO agencies because we also include the team that does our public workforce system. So if you've worked with the WIOA program, that's a program that runs through our organization and is a really critical part of our mission. So, you know, when people talk about SHEO agencies, they say some are more powerful than others. I think all of the state higher education executive agencies have some commonality in that they have the ability to propose solutions at scale and to really shape the statewide conversation about the importance and the role of education and uh, its vitality to the state. So it's a challenging job. Um, you know, we have a vision of every Missourian being empowered with the skills and education needed for success. And that's something that uh, gets me out of bed every morning. And I look forward to sharing a little bit Bit more about um, the specifics of what we've done in the last 18 months. Thank you, Commissioner. So appreciate your kind words and your partnership. And we know that you're not just about getting in a room and talking about things, but really about mm -hmm. translating that into action to support students. So thank you for all you have done to support higher education in Missouri. Um, Janet, I'd love to turn to you next. Um, could you tell the audience a little bit about your background? What brought you to your current role? 
and a little bit about how ACT thinks about supporting higher education students and policymakers. That's great. Thank you, James. And just want to echo uh, Zora's thanks for the Hunt Institute and all of the good work that you do. Um, but good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janet Godwin, and I'm CEO at ACT. And um, I have moved into this role after 31 years of service to this amazing organization. Um, we've been uh, in, the, in the area of helping students pursue their college and career readiness success opportunities since 1959. And I'm really pleased to be able to carry on that tradition. Um, we're all about creating opportunities, uh, creating access and opportunities for all students. And what that means is, helping high school students start creating a path for what their pathway after high school looks like, whether that's into a four-year college uh, system, to a community college, to a workforce agency, and, or straight to employment or to the service. Uh, and so things and services that ACT has historically provided is, is planning tools, navigation tools for students and for high school counselors and for educators, state and district policymakers, so they can understand how their students are progressing through their high school experience so they can affect uh, curriculum and other intervention strategies to help students be prepared and ready for post-secondary work. Um, I'm lucky in that I've worked in many different roles at ACT. I, I understand test and I spent many years there, uh, research, IT operations, field sales. I've done just about anything you can imagine that this wonderful organization needs, but throughout all of that, uh, I think the thing that runs through um, everything that we've done and, and all the stakeholders that we work with is a, is a passion for student success and helping students find those pathways to success. Um, some of the things that we do, obviously assessment, um, but we do generate a lot of research. Uh, we have an amazing data source um, and we apply that data source with other uh, data uh, inputs to help understand some big themes and trends that are going on in education right now, both in, in K-12, but also as students are transitioning into higher education. Um, and you can imagine um, our research agenda has pivoted a bit uh, since the, the COVID uh, pandemic has hit our country and world. And so um, we're taking long, hard looks at the uh, unfinished learning gaps that are appearing with students um, since the spring of 2020. We're looking into social emotional health and well-being as that has been impacted significantly uh, for students and educators uh, through the pandemic. Um, and we're trying very, very hard to and keep students moving into this post-secondary planning, preparation, and readiness activities. So uh, it's been disrupted, but our goal is here to help students stay on course and to support the institutions that are there to serve students and in, in their next steps after high school. So thank you, James, for the opportunity this afternoon. Thanks, Janet, and thanks to you and your team for the great and helpful research you've been producing, especially in the wake of the pandemic and you know, special recognition to Tina Gridiron and the team at the Center for Equity and Learning who have been really instrumental in documenting how the pandemic has exacerbated equity gaps in different areas. So thanks for your valuable contributions. Gerard, uh, I would love to turn to you next. Um, I know you've worn many hats throughout your career, so if you can limit your background to this five minute suggestion and that would be wonderful, but it would be great to hear what brought you to your current role and a little bit about um, how you currently approach thinking about higher ed policy and, and supporting students and institutions. Thank you, James, and thank you, Dr. Sabiki, for the uh, invitation. I want to thank uh, Janet and Zora for allowing me to join the conversation. So I'm Vice President of Education at the Advanced Studies uh, Culture Institute here in Charlottesville, Virginia. We're a support organization to a research center here at the University of Virginia. And it's actually interesting that we're having a conversation about virtual education or learning, sweep it or keep it. I would say in 2021 that we keep it. But I said the same thing 22 years ago. Uh, so in 1999, I was at the University of Virginia, uh, me, um, several people from the University of Virginia School of Education, some administrators and students traveled from Charlottesville to the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and so while in Scotland, we were part of a uh, conversation with Europeans about the future of higher education. Um, Dr. Burba at the time, and I wanna dedicate my presentation to him, he has since passed. Uh, we worked on a paper together talking about the important idea of higher education and the use of online learning. Well, part of what drove that for us was, was two things. Number one, there were some universities um, who were experimenting with it within the Commonwealth. But at that time, Duke University was one of the first top 25 schools, at least business schools, who said we're going to offer an online learning package. And so at the event at the University of Edinburgh, we talked about online learning, 
what it could look like, what it could mean. And at the end, one gentleman walked up to me and he said, do you really think that people are gonna turn on to the idea of learning online when for a hundred plus years we've done it in class? And I said, yeah. And then he followed up with a very interesting point. He said, well, do you think uh, our major colleges would do it? And I said, yes. What he was asking was a question about brand. Can a Duke University really keep its brand and then become an online uh, distributor of its knowledge without diluting the work? Well, that was in 1999. Fast forward to 2021, University of Virginia is already involved in online learning. You have institutes of higher education across the country who are doing the same thing. What brought me to this work is that we focus here a lot on um, culture and what that means for changing how people think and how they move in their work. Not only do I work here as VP of education, but I also uh, teach a, uh, a uh, seminar every spring at UVA Law School. Well, you can imagine that in mid course, all of a sudden I went from teaching students in person to having to switch midstream and working with students online and then having to do the same thing the next spring. So I've had a chance to look at it for 22 years and I'm pretty excited about it. So I say we keep it, but if there's one thing we have to sweep is our idea of what we think the American student looks like today because they're over the age of 25, they're not on campus more often, they're not throwing frisbees, and they're not on meal plans. And it's just, it's just a change. I think if anything, we better sweep that mentality. Yeah, such fascinating uh, context. It's so interesting to hear the context of these questions being debated you know, 20 years ago and how some of the same issues are still coming up today, but with, with more nuance and, and different context. So thanks so much, Gerard. We'll look forward to hearing more from you. Um, I am going to now go ahead and ask an opening question for each of our panelists. I hope that you all will be thinking of questions as well. I think I saw a hand or two raised and I just wanna remind folks that we're not gonna be, able, gonna be able to unmute lines. So please submit any questions using the Q&A feature. But I'm gonna kick things off with a question for Commissioner Mulligan. Commissioner, I know that throughout your work, you and your team place a strong emphasis on ensuring that all students, regardless of things like age or income or race and ethnicity, are able to access and succeed in higher education. So as you've approached uh, the post-pandemic work from that lens, can you talk a little bit about which students were most harmed uh, by the shift to online learning and what implications that might have for some medium or long-term trends? Um, and we'd also be interested to hear um, anecdotally, whether there were students who benefited from the shift and, and what policymakers should take away from those experiences. Sure. So you mentioned, um, you know, the, the importance and the focus that we put on equity. As I mentioned, our vision statement is every Missourian being empowered with the skills and education needed for success. That word every is very, very important in the work we do. And so we have done a lot of, of work over the last two years in particular to start pulling apart and disaggregating our data as much as our systems allow us to do so we can understand what's really happening, both in the big picture state level as well as with individual populations. Uh, you know, what we have seen in COVID really is um, an, a, a continuation of long-term concerning trends, uh, particularly with regard to adult students and with regard to Black students. Uh, our adult student enrollment is down about 40% as a percent of the student body over the last 10 years. Black student enrollment as a percent of the student body is down about 10% over that period of time. Both of those were significantly um, accelerated during the uh, kind of the COVID era. So, you know, this fall we saw lots of declines of, among um, adults and uh, ad excuse me and among black students in particular so you know when we take a step back and ask ourselves what are the tools that we have um, you know to, to begin to address some of these disparities I think like a lot of organizations we're still really thinking about you know what works in this time of COVID and how much do you change your systems to adapt to something that we're hoping is a temporary um, occurrence I think, you know, Gerard said, do we keep or uh, sweep uh, online learning? I would say we, we, we tweak. We don't do either keep or sweep, but we tweak it because we did see lots of different reactions, you know, among different students uh, this year. It's not hard to figure out, you know, with adults, some of the complications they faced in, in succeeding in online learning. But again, we have to look at it in the context of the longer term uh, enrollment decline that we've seen and, and to think about what that means. 
Um, you know, Janet mentioned something that really resonated with me, and that's the importance of thinking about a lot of different success pathways post after high school. And so, you know, one of the things that we view as an important part of our role is framing what success looks like after high school, and that's certainly continued in the COVID era. So we talk about five different pathways to success, and that includes certificates um, and work-based learning, associate degrees, bachelor degrees, graduate and professional degrees. And so just thinking about, you know, aligning our state resources and policies um, with opportunities in all of those categories has been important. I mentioned in my introduction that our staff includes the team that oversees our public workforce system. And that means that we have people in offices around the state who've been working with unemployed Missourians uh, you know, during uh, COVID. And they provided a lot of very, very valuable feedback in, in terms of the kinds of concerns they have and the kinds of obstacles they're facing in terms of enrolling and training programs. The biggest one won't surprise anybody, and it's just logistics. This is consistent with national data that Strata and other organizations have found, but time and logistics is the biggest concern that our adult population has identified in the last year. We have been able to put significant resources behind that. We're um, investing in childcare facilities at colleges and universities around the state, but it doesn't fix last fall. And so as we look forward to the future, I think we are gonna see a long-term um, challenge in terms of everyone who missed opportunities this year. So we know that that is a real challenge. Uh, we also see in Missouri, as, as the na national data indicate, adults have a lot of questions about the utility of higher education or any kind of post-secondary education. And that um, difference has really been accelerated during COVID. There's a great strata study that asked adults across the country about, you know, their estimate of whether additional education would be worth the cost uh, declined very, very dramatically among adults across the country last year, and whether they thought it would make them more attractive to a potential employer. So again, you know, a, a dramatic deceleration. So if you're in the business of trying to quote unquote sell higher education or post-secondary education, those perceptions about value are really, really important to understand and think about how to um, counteract those. Uh, so, you know, in addition to those questions about time and logistics, about value, we're facing a unique challenge here in Missouri with adults in particular, in that we have a very, very tight labor market, and that tight labor market is driving wages up, even for the kinds of jobs that don't require any kind of post-secondary education. And so convincing people, you know, that they need to invest in themselves and take that time is challenging in an environment in which their eyes tell them that's not the case. So it is an interesting time, and I'll be happy to talk a little bit more about that later, but I'm really interested in hearing what my fellow panelists have to say. Yeah, that's such a, such a great summary of the different forces at play and how they're dovetailing with each other and creating such a complex situation for, for adult learners who are um, really trying to make the calculation, you know, do I try to get a short term certificate to get back on my feet? And I love how you mentioned the, the breadth of pathways that need to be available to folks as well. So all these things play into each other, um, but the, that's very helpful context. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Janet, my next question is for you. Um, uh, the Commissioner talked a lot about kind of pathways that people can, can take within higher education, but I know that you and the team at ACT do a lot of thinking about pathways into higher education and think about the college going plans of potential higher education students. So since you all have had your ear to the ground in that space, can you talk a little bit about how this shift to online learning might have impacted the college going plans of some potential higher education students? And were there any particular strategies that you and your team used to try to minimize some of those disruptions? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, and thank you, uh, Commissioner, for your comments too. Learned a lot listening to you. And I think we could have conversations um, about so many of the topics that you raised. Um, but so for, for high school students in the in the in the impact of the pandemic, it's been actually very profound. And, and it's not just the shift to online learning, hybrid learning. It's um, it's 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 the trauma. I'll use that word that that many families have experienced through the pandemic, whether it's economic loss or family and uh, health uh, matters. And so, you know, helping high school students um, in these kinds of environments. Um, 
keep an eye on their progress and preparation for whatever path they choose to take after high school has been challenging. Um, online learning, um, I know, is, is, is not for everyone. We've, we've seen um, some of the, 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 the classic digital divide issues come to bear um, these last 18 uh, months or so, where, where some families don't have access to internet hotspots or devices or a quiet learning environment uh, at home to participate in Zoom uh, uh, online learning. And so um, while some students may have flourished in, in those sorts of environments, we know that many, many students did not. Um, we talked about already social, emotional health and well-being and um, the engagement of online learning when you're in front of a computer for hours a day um, is tough. I think it's tough for adults. And when we've asked uh, so many of our students across the country to, to, to learn that way for so long that that those kinds of social um, uh, questions, I think, are are uh, need to be top of mind for us, and we need to move uh, our research into. Um, speaking of research, um, it is something that ECT will be pursuing. I mentioned a sort of a shift in our research agenda: um, opportunity loss, learning loss. Uh, unfinished learning, how does that break down against uh, different uh, groups of students, including um, uh, low-income students, Black, uh, Latino students, first-generation students? Um, we need to understand the impacts of these kinds of modes of learning on all kinds of uh, different student populations and start digging in to understand what's working and what's not. Um, and engagement models is, is incredibly important um, for online learning to continue to be a, a good tool for us. So while I applaud uh, what high schools did in the pandemic to so very quickly transition to online, um, I will just urge and encourage every district to lean in on and the engagement models for their online learning programs and how to make them most efficacious for all of the students that they're serving. Um, some of the things that we've been doing at ACT besides um, you know, continuing to push out our, our, our research agenda with a heavy focus on equity around online is, is just to continue to encourage students to intentionally plan for their path after high school. So some of the things that we do very uh, concretely in this regard, um, we have an American College application campaign. Every fall, we work in all 50 states, including the District of Columbia, and go into high schools and, and spend time with students. What does it mean to apply for college? Let's unpack the, the, the process and make it more easy to understand. Help students fill out a financial aid form, um, because as we know, um, economic uh, means is, is a barrier for many students going into higher ed. So uh, applying for FAFSA aid is, is an important step for getting ready for college. Um, thinking about what classes to take, thinking about what a good college fit would be for you based on your interests and passions and, and desires uh, after, after after high school. So we, we do those kinds of things through our American College application campaign. Um, we've been really, really focusing on um, helping to provide as many testing opportunities as possible um, to give students the opportunity to see where are they in their college readiness and academic readiness path, um, working a lot with states and districts to help them provide testing opportunities to students within a classroom during the school day, uh, again, to take away some barriers around transportation and cost for the individual students. So very, very focused on, on providing accessible testing opportunities. And then another thing that we're doing is just um, continuing to, to really work with our stakeholders across the, the, the ecosystem. We did some significant research this winter with higher ed enrollment and admissions officers, with district and state uh, policymakers, with parents, high school counselors, understanding their needs around helping to prepare students for success after high school. We gleaned a lot of good information about what those pain points are, what the ongoing needs will be. And one of those needs was to have a good good transparent pipeline of students who are moving into that college application and college admissions process. And so our goal is to provide as much transparent data as we possibly can to colleges and to states and districts, um, but also to um, uh, be part of the national dialogue as well, uh, to be at the table with research data, to be able to contribute to the conversations of what we keep or sweep, um, recognizing that we all have room to improve. We want to work together to create better equitable pathways for students. And so we feel that our research and also our, our willingness to engage and be part of the solution is, is something we're going to continue to be doing. So thanks, James, for um, the opportunity to talk a bit about what ACT is doing uh, in that transition space for students from high school school to college. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Janet. That's all such important work, um, and we appreciate you uh, 
um, telling us about it. Um, Gerard, uh, next question over to you and a quick reminder to our audience that um, we look forward to your questions for the panel. Please submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, but while folks are thinking of and typing their questions, Gerard, I'd like to revisit your perspective. And in particular, you mentioned um, in the opening remarks that you are a professor who experienced this shift firsthand as you sought to support your own students during this time. And I also know uh, that you are the host of a podcast, The Learning Curve, where you often bring on leading and experts and practitioners to hear what they're thinking and how they're responding to the pandemic. So could you talk a little bit about both of those perspectives? What was it like for you as a professor dealing with this shift? And secondly, what have you been hearing from some of the folks that you've been engaging with around how they've approached uh, this difficult time? That was a great question. So uh, I'm a lecturer at UVA Law School. And I say that in part because my wife's the real professor. And so Brother <laughs> Robinson will come in and correct me if I don't. So I wanna make sure I'm clear about that. Um, so let me backward map into that one um, because how we arrive at the point of talking about virtual education uh, post COVID is very different than the fact that virtual education existed long before COVID-19. It's just that COVID-19 exposed a lot of stuff that we kind of put under the screen. So let's look at why people decide to go the virtual route. It's not only because we have students who are older uh, as one factor, but you look at the fact that the tuition in American higher education has increased you know, 500%, well actually 800% since 1980. That's 5%, five, five times faster than what we saw for inflation. You had a number of people who wanted to do a career shift, but decided they simply could not leave their job to go back to college full time like they had done when they were an undergraduate student and assume the debt and everything that comes with it. So it moved from a question of affordability to accessibility. And so many people began to go that route. If you take a look at data from the uh, US Department of Education, in the 1990s, we saw a nice uptick in enrollment in public, non-private, non-profit universities, private, non-profit institutions. But if you looked at online learning, there was a 200% increase. And when people began to unpack as to why, people simply said the ability not to leave my job full time or the fact that I'm taking care of children or a loved one. It gives me an opportunity to do that, but not have to leave my home. Another factor we have to look at in virtual learning is the role that the um, uh, venture capital market is playing in this work. You know, when you're, when you're talking to lawmakers, and I've had a chance to work for two of them, when you're looking at higher ed, you're talking about budgets and you're talking about buildings. Well, you had venture capital people who say, well, what about brands? How can we invest not only in the universities, but into apps and into companies to create a platform in which adults could actually learn across space and time? So those are some of the dynamics that shape how we should at least think about learning. So for me, I'm teaching class and I received an email from the associate dean who said because of COVID-19 and because of the announcement by the uh, governor and the president, we're gonna go to online class. And guess what? We're gonna do it pretty quickly. And so we had to shift. The great thing about uh, our deans at the University of Virginia School of Law is they had a plan in place. Some of that was in place just because as a dean, you have to have things ready, but we actually had to shift. So all of a sudden, every student that I was able to talk to and to interact with, we were all online. And so we finished the rest of the semester doing that. There was a change on two things. Number one was just the, frank, just the interaction. Um, number of people who are behind screens like we are right now having a conversation. This is somewhat normal now, but this is conversational. It's a little different when you're a student and you know your grade depends upon all the interactions that go along, but also the spirit and the energy that comes when you're in person and in a class. So that dynamic changed. Uh, number two, I went to school in the 1990s. Um, I went to graduate school in the 1990s. There's no course that I ever took that was online. So I also had to go through a shift. And so the, um, the university provided us training on what best practices look like for teaching uh, online. And teachers also began to talk to each other offline, you know, what's working in your class and what's not. It was also interesting to read body language differently. You could see who's reading uh, a cell phone versus those who are not. So there were some very interesting dynamics. All things held equal, we're going to go back into person, uh, in-person teaching this fall with the Delta variant. We'll see if that will change. Um, but I enjoyed the work. I look forward to getting in, uh, going back in person. And the students also said they missed being in class. In fact, we even, even had some of the students uh, come to our home in the backyard 
uh, with the appropriate distance, just to make sure that we can at least have ended with one portion of saying we're together uh, and we're going. But I think as we move forward, we can't look uh, overlook the role that um, venture capital is playing in this, the role that social entrepreneurs are playing. And so when I have them on our podcast called The Learning Curve, which we do uh, weekly, um, they're basically saying two things, uh, that even young people who are deciding to get to earn stackable credentials in high school, who may decide not to go directly into college, but go directly into the workforce, are using CTE in unique ways that we just had not seen before. So that's something that's important. And number two, a lot of moms, particularly in some communities, uh, the mom is not only the economic breadwinner, but also the one who's raised the family. The number of moms who said, you know what? COVID-19 is making me rethink not only my own career, but how I can actually become an entrepreneur either for myself or think more entrepreneurial in the work that I'm doing. So there's a really interesting dynamic, particularly given the fact that you have 2 million more women doing now in higher ed uh, than we have men. So there's some interesting dynamics that are taking place. And I think it will help uh, us rethink what it means to deliver uh, higher ed, be both on campus and online. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gerard. Um, just quickly before we jump into audience questions, I, there uh, is one thing in particular Gerard touched on that I'd love to um, invite the other two folks to comment on is that that's this idea that um, not only is it the students that need to adapt to this new environment, but it's the, the educators, the instructors and lecturers as well. And they need training. It's not as simple as downloading Zoom and just doing your regular lesson plan. Um, you know, it, it really is a more nuanced, more complex thing to be delivering instruction in this remote way. Commissioner or Janet, do either of you have further thoughts on the importance of making sure that educators are able to manage this shift appropriately? I can comment briefly. You know, in our conversations with educators and with administrators around the state, we're really, really proud of the, the shift that everyone made so quickly. And I think everybody recognizes what a heroic effort it was. In our conversations with students, they feel a little bit less amazed <laughs> by how great everything was. And I think, you know, students in, in had a very ununiform experience. So many students had really, you know, great experiences with their professors online. And others will tell you they didn't hear a whole lot uh, from professors or, or their um, support services weren't well connected to their academic experience. So I do think there is a lot um, to be gained in terms of professional development. I also think, you know, when we, when you asked a question about who benefited from the shift to online learning, and I, I tell you, I had to kind of laugh, <laughs> but I think it's also an unfair question. You know, when you ask people, how did it go last spring? They're not only evaluating their experience with online classes, they're uh, telling you what it was like to live with things anxiety and economic uncertainty yeah. and other things. But the one thing I'll say is that the, the students from whom we heard the most positive comments were those who were interacting with organizations that had already been getting good at online education long before March of 2020. And so, you know, through partnerships that we have with organizations like CompTIA, we saw really great results, but, you know, they are in this business and they've really been thinking about how to do it successfully for a long time. So I, I do think this is a moment where, you know, as we look at the market, the schools that are further along are going to accelerate in this direction and those for whom this was just sort of an emergency or temporary measure are likely to go back to something that looks exactly like, you know, February 20. 2020. But it's it's certainly a very real factor. Yeah. Thanks, Commissioner. Janet, anything you want to chime in? With? Sure. Uh, I just uh, echo um, comments from both Gerard and, and Zora. Uh, and I will put my school board hat on for just a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on a school board during the pandemic, uh, worked with uh, educators in our district uh, closely. And again, heroes, honestly, flipping yeah. so quickly to uh, an online um, model. But interestingly, just as I said earlier, online learning is good for some students. Some students who had been experiencing harassment or bullying in a classroom felt relief by not having to be in that kind of social setting. But a lot of students didn't have amazing experiences and for a lot of reasons, but educators too have different preferences for the mode in which they are going to be most successful in teaching. And so I think one of the things that we learned in our district is trying to provide optionality for teachers as much as we possibly could to, to give some choice in there. Um, uh, for, for 
for, for, or for teachers who are really, really good at on engaging students through a Zoom interface versus uh, teachers that really do uh, want to be face to face with students. Um, but professional development is key. You don't just, you know, or you're not just born knowing how to engage students in an online learning environment. There are techniques, there's tools, there's, tr there's tricks, there's things that we can do to employ to make it a more meaningful, relevant experience for everybody. Um, and then the other thing I think just looking forward, um, it will be interesting to see, I think, uh, how schools may adopt hybrid modes for certain kinds of the curriculum um, offerings that they have. Um, the, 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 the online with some uh, in-person may well be a pretty good way to, to advance certain uh, academic um, uh, domains. And so I'm looking forward to seeing how the uh, innovation and how the continuous improvement and, and really trying to figure out how to learn from the best of what we've all experienced to take that forward into better learning opportunities for education and for students. And James, one thing that Zora and Janet just said that reminded me, one group who really did not fare well were adults with disabilities. Yeah. And the same with the children with disabilities. You know, we've had 50 plus million adults in the United States uh, with a disability, and we weren't doing well before COVID-19. And there were some real challenges uh, so I looked at groups like Respectability, which is headquartered in Maryland, um, for ideas on what to do because they actually represent um, people who have disabilities. So just one group that we should make sure we should uh, pay more attention to moving ahead. Absolutely. I so appreciate you adding that into Robin. It's uh, so important and so helpful. Um, we've got some great questions coming in. Please keep them coming. I am going to kick things off with a, an anonymous question about um, how we know how students are faring or how they fared as they navigated this remote learning environment. We heard a little bit about assessment, how to check in and, and see where students are, um, see how well they have um, you know, absorbed information through this remote learning environment. Um, I'd be curious to hear each of you talk about what are some ways we can think about um, accurately and, and adequately uh, learning more information about how students' academic progress um, may have been, been halted or derailed by this online learning environment. What are some ways we can learn more about how students have fared during this time? Commissioner, can we start with you? We can, and I'll start by confessing that there are limitations in our ability at the state level to learn that. So I mentioned you know, that we did talk with students. We did a series of after action reports that included interviews, and that provides some information, but it has significant limits. We can look at the data that's available to us on things like you know, completion of credit hours or um, fall to fall persistence, or you know, an, an enrollment in remedial courses from someone who's just graduated from high school. And part of the reason I don't feel great about those data sources is they all look like everything is great. <laughs> and I know that it's not. And so you know, the, the data we have is suggesting that students are completing their courses at higher rates than they have in the past. Our, our fall to fall retention is actually in general fairly positive. Remedial course um, enrollment is uh, on track with normal trends. But I know that's not the full story. And so I'm hoping that Janet in particular can point me to some assessments that can give me better information than what we have. No pressure, Janet. Yeah, right. oh. So I think probably I'm going to lead with assessment as one of the ways to gauge uh, the impact of learning uh, through the last 18 months or so as, as learning has been disrupted. And I mentioned ACT has been doing research and some of the data sources that we have through ACT program, pre-ACT Aspire. Um, and, we're, and, 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 we've, and we're showing that there are score declines in, in domains uh, in academic domains uh, year over year and breaking it down then into student populations to understand are, are those, um, are those uh, declines uh, uh, the same for every student group or are we seeing disproportionate impacts? Um, the other thing that we have to do more research in is uh, the, the, the impact of online versus hybrid versus in-person education. Those modes are incredibly important for us to dig into to see if those are having impacts on learning. Um, some other things, 
Um, you mentioned uh, doing after action reviews and, 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 and interviews with, with students. I think, um, you know, digging in on um, the emotional health or the well being or the social emotional aspects of how students are faring. And so there are um, SEL, uh, social emotional learning um, instruments and, and, and tools that can be used to gauge how students are feeling in terms of their, are, are they frustrated? Are they wanting to give up? Are they, are they able to persist through all the different challenges? that they've been facing. And so I think trying to get a read on some of those social uh, dynamics that students are experiencing, because it's not just academic readiness, it's the social emotional readiness for uh, getting through high school, but then also being successful in whatever students choose next. So I think intentional um, looks at, at that dimension uh, of students is really helpful too. And then, and then there's other more aggregate data you can look at is enrollment rates from different popu uh, different high schools and there were declines in, in, in college enrollments from low income, uh, low income schools. How do we dig into that data and see um, what's going on in that school to help remediate? So, um, but I think uh, the other thing um, that could be done is, is, uh, is some kind of climate survey, you know, getting at, again, more of that social uh, approach that students may be feeling from this experience this last couple of years. So um, that, that I think could also be helpful as well. Thanks, Janet. Gerard, what are your thoughts on this? I think one place we have to assess is the bureaucratic response to COVID-19. So for example, I had a chance to work with a group of sitting and former superintendents, state education chiefs and others uh, through a group at the American Enterprise Institute. And we just went through a lot of information on how school districts, how states responded. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, someone at your state capital has got to pull a lever uh, to have the CARES money come to your school, to get to your school board. And they also have to pull a lever to say, well, is this going to work or not? So I think putting getting together with groups of people, both left and right, who live in different parts of the country and who bring a different lens is helpful. So I think the AEI report is important. I also go to scholars. You know, I look at people like Robin Lake, uh, who's doing some good work and look at what ACT and others are doing. So there's a good point there. I think another assessment point is talking to, at the K-12 level, to school leaders, because principals are the ones who are responsible for buildings. And even though in some instances, students were there half time, online other times, or they were gone all year, principals ultimately, uh, the buck stopped with him or her. And so we recently had 12 principals from across the country come here uh, to Watson Manor uh, in Charlottesville. And we asked them that question, you know, how was it and what happened? And it was mixed. Uh, as Zora said, you know, on one hand, we're doing a lot of rah-rah, things are going great. But we talked to principals who are hearing parents cry, not the students, the parents are crying. There's a lot of stuff going on. So I think we have to have an assessment tool for the 90,000 plus principals across the country because they are the ones at some point who are closer to this than others. And I think we often overlook them when we think about assessment models. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. Such a complex situation out there hard to capture, but these are all such helpful thoughts. I am going to combine two of the questions uh, we received, which both zero in on this idea of who benefits uh, from this shift, who may not benefit from this shift. Becky Green uh, starts by thanking Janet for pointing out that we need to ask what's working for whom. Um, and Becky points out that the developmental students she teaches often do not function well online. And Becky is wondering about how she communicates to her colleagues that, as she puts it, one size does not fit all. And I think that's nicely related to another anonymous question we got earlier, which uh, is asking, are there ways to identify students that will excel in virtual learning and ways to identify students that may struggle in this setting? Um, so we'd love for you to talk a little bit more specifically about that dynamic. And why don't we do the same order? So Commissioner, we'll go to you for a response first. Sure, so I think it's a great question, you know, and I, I think, um, as I said earlier, I want to be really cautious about judging online education too harshly because we may have had positive and negative experiences during COVID. As a resource and as a tool, it's really critical to every state in meeting its higher education and post-secondary goals. So we need to get back to that point about identifying the people for whom it's going to be a, a successful resource and those who it's not. Uh, I don't have a great answer to that question because it's not part of the universe in which I work. So I'm interested in hearing if my uh, fellow panelists have a good perspective to add. Janet, anything to add on this? 
Yeah, I'll jump in. It, it, it relates um, uh, partially to the research that we need to do into the different learning modes, uh, uh, all in person, hybrid, and online. And if we can, if we can start unpacking that through some good um, evidence-based um, results, you know, what's efficacious for what kind of learner? If we can start unpacking the the learner attributes that are um, aligned with a different mode of learning, I think that might help us to that question around, are there certain, certain students that we can identify that are, this is a, that online is a really great uh, forum and a mode for them from a learning perspective. And, and um, I th think that's a, a great set of research questions for us and other organizations uh, to, to really dig into because it's not one size fits all. There are students who will perform better online versus in a, in a classroom setting and vice versa. Um, I so appreciate, uh, Gerard, you bringing out the needs around special education students, um, and I think that was woven into uh, some of the questions, uh, James, that, James, that you just presented, um, because it is, it, 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 that population of students um, is it, largely not going to be effective uh, in an online environment. There needs to be other classroom supports, teacher supports, other kinds of interactions, and we just need to be very, very mindful that from an access and equity um, standpoint, that whatever solutions we bring to bear in our classrooms, in our schools, that we must make sure that we take into account the needs of, of special education students and provide them the equitable resources that they need so they can be successful as well. So I think this is a really keen, uh, key set of research questions um, that, that educators and, and workforce uh, employers uh, who do you know, training uh, for employers would really benefit from. And so um, I'll be anxious to see you know, how that research evolves on this modality of learning. Yeah, Gerard, you did already pull in uh, the idea of adult students and all students with disabilities. Um, what other thoughts do you have on this question? You know, like Zora, I don't have any particular one-stop shop on what who it will work for and who it will not. But I least have three places where uh, you can take a look or, or people. One, I'd say Michael Horn, uh, who's written a lot about uh, online learning, so I'd say, or virtual education. I'd say go there. Number two, I would take a look at the United States military. Um, you know, they were involved in online or distance learning long before it found itself uh, really a part of higher education just because of the type of the work they're in. Uh, the military in many ways looks more like America than some of our universities. And so that could be one place to look to see what they've learned from having to work with adults across the country, but across the world uh, on online learning, uh, particularly at the K-12 level for those who are in BOD schools. Uh, that's one place I'd look. Uh, the second, and I frankly would take a look at uh, what's come out of the uh, for-profit. Uh, providers. Uh, we know for social reasons there are a lot of challenges uh, that have come along with some of those um, predatory practices and marketing practices uh, that administrations have dealt with, but they've been in the business of working with adult learners for a long time, and so they have, you know, decades worth of uh, information that we can take a look at. So those are at least three places I'd go to take a look to try to at least start scratching uh, the surface looking for an answer. I would add one thing to that, Gerard, which is, you know, organizations like Western Governors University, which look from the outside a little bit like a for-profit, but on the inside operate very differently. They have a long track record of assessment to try to identify which individuals are going to be successful in their programs. And I think, you know, broadening our universe of who we look to um, for solutions would include an organization like WGU because they know things that the rest of us can really benefit from learning. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you so much. And, and Gerard, Sarah really appreciates your point on military connected learning. Yeah. Um, the next question, um, which maybe we can do kind of a rapid response round to, um, again, from an anonymous user, how do we ensure that incoming students who may be attending in a virtual format could still foster a sense of belonging um, with their institution or with their fellow classmates? Um, are there strategies to try and instill that sense of belonging in students in a virtual format, Commissioner? Uh, uh, this is not a fast question and I apologize for a little bit long of an answer, but I, I have a couple of thoughts. And one is I think, um, you know, I have a background working in some student affairs and I know that belonging is one of the most important factors in determining a student's success. I also know that there are all different kinds of students and the fact that belonging was a really important factor in my own success as a college student is not necessarily true. And if somebody else could get in and out of school faster with the same amount of education, but not waste so much time on 
on belonging, they might appreciate that. And so I, I, when I hear that question, what I hear for myself is a reminder that I need to put aside some of my own biases about the only way uh, to approach post-secondary education and remember that we need to be broad. In terms of how to do it online, um, I think it's challenging. I think some professors are great at it. I think some schools have done a good job of making their resources available in a way that's actually more accessible than they were when students had to, for example, drive 50 miles to come in for an appointment with an advisor. Uh, but I think it's challenging. And again, I think we have to define success broadly enough to include an experience that may be less of the traditional sense of belonging and more you know, heavily rooted in academic experience. Thanks, Commissioner. Janet, any thoughts on this question about sense of belonging? Yeah, it's it's a tough one, and and I know uh, colleges are are working through everything from virtual tours for you know recruitment and orientation for students, but you know building affinity groups online so that students can uh, connect with uh, students who are in the same academic domain or other interests that they share. So these sort of online forms, I think, uh, I've seen um, uh, coming out, but. Um, you know, and, and kind of back to um, sort of the professional development concepts we were talking about earlier too, is just working with faculty, working with student affairs, professionals, others on campuses to create some experiences that can foster that sense of belonging. I think it's gonna be a lot of trial and error to figure out what um, might work. And I, 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 I know that colleges around the country are, are experimenting and doing all kinds of things in this regard. And um, and I think the spirit of innovation and in, 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 in talking to students to see what works and what doesn't, and just continuously improving upon that. Makes sense. Gerard, what are your thoughts on this question? Prison education is adult education. We just tend not to think of them as part of the higher education universe. And I bring this in because I've said for several years now that some of the innovative ideas that are going to come out as to how do we reach non-traditional adult learners are, in fact, people who are in prison. Now, those who are incarcerated had the same challenges as those on the, on the uh, we call the free world. Um, many of them had their in uh, their virtual classes uh, halted because of this. Many of them had their in-person classes halted. But the reason I bring this up is because you have social workers and counselors who've been working with adults who are going to school in prison for a very long time who had to deal with the idea of belonging even before we had virtual learning. So that is one place I would take a look at in terms of what have they done there to create a sense, uh, particularly in a place where belonging is not something that's um, always healthy. Yeah, I love these I think, directions. You know, Gerard said something earlier about climate surveys. I mean, my uh, unsolicited advice is that we need to ask students as much as we can, as often as we can, because it's such an unusual situation that we're living and working in. I don't think we're going to guess correctly. And I think really, you know, hearing from students, all different kinds of students is the key to this. And one last thing I would add is just looking at the social experiences that we have in various forms like Facebook, Twitter. I mean, these kind there's 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 something to be learned for those online social um, uh, platforms and how that could might translate into this question. Absolutely, uh, Commissioner, you just said I asked a big question and didn't give much time to respond. I'm going to do it again. I apologize in advance, <laughs> but in our remaining three minutes or so. I'd love for you each to briefly comment on an interesting forward-looking question we got from an anonymous attendee who, who, who notes that a lot of the creation or expansion of these virtual learning courses happened as part of a crisis response. What does virtual learning look like in the future when it's not tied to a crisis response? It's, that is you. such a great question. Um, I think it is deeply steeped in exactly everything that the other panelists have already said, which is professional development paired with individual aptitude, you know, so that you have a situation in which uh, professors know how to teach online and they have an interest in, a, in an aptitude for it and students have an interest in an aptitude in that kind of learning. I do think, you know, the, the future of learning is customized and is likely look, to look different for different students and different, um, you know, deliverers, but uh, I think in the future, one where people can opt into online uh, classes for some or all of their education is really critical. Absolutely. Janet, what are your thoughts on this? It's very similar to what the commissioner was just sharing. I think options, being clear about what academic domain makes sense for online learning. If you're studying to be... Uh, 
you know, a welder or something. I mean, you, you've got to practice on the physical artifacts to actually practice and learn that particular domain. So I think being smart and intentional uh, around what courses and domains lend themselves to online, uh, those that don't, and then giving students the choice uh, based on their own learning styles and preferences. Yeah. Gerard, what do you think the future holds for virtual learning? I agree with my colleagues. Um, pretty much what he said is spot on. Uh, when you mentioned the part about crisis, I think about uh, September Clark, who Martin Luther King called uh, one of his mentors. Uh, she was an African-American woman educated in the segregated South, particularly Tennessee, who said that she likes chaos. And she said, I like chaos because from chaos comes creativity. And I think one of the creative things that are kind of going to come out of this chaos is an intergenerational dialogue. The 90-year-olds and the 10-year-olds having a question having a conversation about one question, what is the purpose of education? We haven't had that education cross generations in a really long time. I think that's something that will come out of it and naturally it will influence what virtual education will look like. Absolutely. And what a terrific quote. Um, thank you so much to Commissioner Mulligan, Janet and Gerard. This was a very fascinating conversation. I hope you all learned as much as I did. Um, before we depart, I wanna let you know about some upcoming webinars that we're hosting at the Hunt Institute later this month that we hope you'll join us for. Tuesday, August 10th is our latest homeroom series on the social emotional health of students in the upcoming year. A week following will be our latest in the race and education series. All politics are local, school boards in the fight for racial equality. And uh, towards the end of the month, we'll have our governing principles series on the school calendar and time for learning. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. We so appreciate your engagement and we look forward to seeing you again on a Hunt Institute webinar sometime soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye now.